Okay, welcome to um, our first Friday property abandonment and housing development meeting. Um, I don't see any new faces here today. Are there are some folks? Are there some folks that people don't know? Does everybody know each other? Wow. Mercy. Yeah, well, excuse me. Um, the Snyder, is it the Snyder family? Yes. Yep. Would you, would you introduce her? Yeah, of course. It's graduation weekend, so I brought my family. It's convenient, it worked out nice. So uh, my dad, my mom, my sister Jenna, uh, my girlfriend Emily, and my roommate and buddy from high school, uh, Eric. So, yeah. Welcome, yeah. Glad you're all able to come see a little bit what we're doing here with land bank and um uh just yeah just kind of what i do every uh before every meeting again this space um we're just trying to yeah have a, an additional space where, where dialogue can happen about um issues related to, to abandonment and vacancy and deteriorating properties um lots of people are doing lots of interesting things and if we can participate in trying to create synergy place for uh, like honest dialogue to happen about these issues that's what we're, we're hoping that this space uh, is and continues to be um, one thing I wanted to mention before I turn it over to our speaker today is uh, I think we're going to move this space into the Mad Jacks building um, starting next month so uh, make that change in the in the uh, calendar invite and also the, the the monthly announcement that goes out through email um, yeah everybody my name is Nate Howard I'm the director of the Muncie Land Bank um, thanks for coming today our, our speaker uh, I'm gonna let will introduce himself because he knows himself better than I do <laughs> um, but uh, I've had multiple people tell me um, that his, his research he's done as part of um, his graduate study um, is really interesting. Um, and so I'm really thankful that you worked us in to your busy week with uh, graduation and everything. Um, but yeah, hopefully we could have some lively discussion um, listening to Will. Would you want to folks to hold their questions or you want people to? Um, that's a good question. I think we can so it's sectioned off a little bit. There's some kind of header sections, so we could weave we could weave discussion in okay. those a little bit. Okay, yeah, yeah great. that would be okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, I will wait. We have somebody here that I don't recognize, or that I hasn't been here before. I recognize her. Would you introduce yourself? Okay. Thank you for coming. Awesome. All right. I'll turn it over. Thank you, Nate. Yeah. Hi, my name is Will Snyder. Uh, I graduated from Ball State's Department of Urban Planning with my bachelor's in urban planning and development this past May. I'm currently pursuing my master's in the same field. Uh, figured, why not tag it on? Um, we have a one-year program at Ball State, so it was pretty, um, made, made the most sense for me to, to come back and really complete my degree here. This is part of my graduate studies around uh, this whole topic because the picture that you see on the screen is an experience I had uh, last year in my own rental unit. So. Um, I had a couple of buddies over. We weren't drinking, we were just hanging out, we were playing board games. Um, and it was the first week that we had moved into our rental unit. And uh, while they were leaving, they fell through our exterior stairs um, in the duplex of our, it, it's a duplex. So we were on the top floor of this, um, what was a single family home split up by our property manager into two units. Um, so it really kind of made me wonder, uh, like, what can I do to really address this problem? After this happened, we had a month go by when our landlord didn't do anything. Um, there was no response from them as to how to deal with the issue. Uh, eventually we went to the city and reported it and our landlord was out that week fixing it. So something clearly exists, right? But as a student and as a renter in town, I had no clue what these resources were. I was just pretty fortunate to be in our planning program and kind of know a little bit about some of city government a little bit there. So um, this really led me to ask the question, what are the lived experiences of tenants in Muncie and uh, overall the policies and powers that tenants have um, when they're engaging in any sort of landlord-tenant relationship? Um, and certainly play, playing into some of the other stakeholders that are in that conversation. So whether those are government officials, um, of course, property managers and landlords themselves. Um, and then again, tenants, whether those are students in town, um, whether those are families, whether those are um, just individuals that are coming 
uh, to work in Muncie and really have no clue what the rental situation is like here. They're coming for the first time looking for a nice place to live um, while they you know, have their job in Muncie. So I wanna talk first about how this project came about, um, how the questions and how the survey uh, was developed. And to do that, I wanna distribute real quick the um, survey that I developed for all of the tenants. So there is, I only have 10 copies, but there's also an online version you can certainly look at. You can scan with your phone and take a look at it. You just pass those down. Yeah, thank you. Pass those down for me. So this was completed in a couple different stages. Um, really the first stage was to identify two neighborhoods that were gonna be the most ideal to sample. Um, really looking at probably a student-based neighborhood and then probably a more non-student-based neighborhood uh, in Muncie. And to do that, I uh, went around and canvassed these two neighborhoods and essentially um, requested folks to talk about their experience on a couple different levels as a tenant. So whether it's signing a lease, uh, the maintenance of their unit, um, all the different uh, like physical elements of what it's like to be uh, a tenant in Muncie. So the two neighborhoods that I ended up choosing for this study were Riverside Normal City and Old West End. Um, in Riverside Normal City, about 84% of the folks there rent their homes. Uh, and then in Old West End, it's about the same, about 82% out of their 856 units. So you have a pretty significant majority of renters in both of these neighborhoods. And this isn't unlike the profile of Muncie. Um, Muncie overall has about uh, 60 to 70% of folks in town that rent according to the US Census. Um, so we have a pretty large population of rental units and tenants in town. And so again, to kind of go through this process here. So when I created the survey, when I first built it, it was about 41 questions. Um, and again, touches on these different elements of what it's like to be a tenant. So what are the physical rental unit conditions? Um, what is the maintenance like when you have to request maintenance? How responsive is your landlord or property manager? Uh, what is communication between your uh, property manager like? Are they super responsive? Do they just ignore you completely? Or do they promise to help and then don't do anything? Uh, those are kind of the three common themes that pulled out of that. And then uh, talking about leasing process and terms. So when you first signed your lease, were you a little bit unsure about some of the language that was in that lease? Did you have the ability to negotiate a little bit within that lease? Um, and then some uh, additional questions regarding neighborhood safety because kind of figured it was relevant to talk to people about why they chose the house that they chose where it is, right? So did you think about the neighborhood that you were selecting uh, when you first signed, when you first moved in, did you feel safe there? Those kinds of things. So when we launched, uh, myself along with some paid volunteers from the university, uh, we went out and canvassed all of those houses. So uh, this picture on the left is the door hanger design. It was a two-sided door hanger that we posted on about 1,700 homes. Um, essentially asking folks to scan the QR code uh, and link to the survey that you were just handed right now. So uh, it was all done online and folks had the opportunity to also provide some open-ended feedback as well as the multiple choice responses. There was a website posted for folks to learn a little bit more about the survey, obviously realizing that um, some people are kind of just, they see like an ad on their door and they might have not been sure what to do about that. So we wanted to inform people about um, what the study is and the project. And then this little screen cap on the bottom right is a picture of, at the end of the survey, you would have the option to sign up to interview. Um, so really humanizing the research a little bit, while I really wanted that quantitative data from the survey, I also wanted to be able to hear some quotes and some um, actual feedback from folks in terms of following up on the survey, what were your experiences overall? From there, did some analysis, double checked that the data and the sample sizes were all good in both neighborhoods. So again, you can see on the right is a GIS screenshot of both neighborhoods, uh, filtered out all of kind of the more commercial buildings and just filtered it to uh, single and multifamily homes in both of those neighborhoods to really, again, make sure that the sample looked good and then did a process of analysis to put together the presentation that we are looking at today. For the interview, uh, again, this was a optional task that someone could sign up for at the end. Uh, it was about 20 minutes per interview and it was about five questions. Again, just kind of following up on the various topics that were asked in the, in the surveys. Um, and folks were compensated with a grant provided by the university. So the key findings really out of this whole study are three pretty major things. So the first one is really that a significant share of tenants and city officials in Muncie are really stuck with a preemptive piece of legislation that was passed in Indiana a couple years ago. I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit, but state law really preempts a lot of ability for the municipalities in the state to get involved in any ten tenant-landlord relationships or negotiations. And then for tenants themselves, they're really not protected. 
Um, it certainly leans more towards landlords in terms of the protection you have from eviction. Um, there's a, not much retaliatory uh, protection, so if you want to go approach the city and have them inspect your home because you don't think that your unit is safe, your landlord can essentially turn around very quickly and evict you for a retaliatory uh, measure. The next one is that negative experiences of tenants are widespread. So as we probably all heard this past fall, there was one property management group in particular that got quite a bit of heat for the quality of their homes. Um, it's not just them. Every, every survey respondent from small local landlords with just a couple of houses to big property management companies with several thousand houses, uh, they all said the same kind of stuff. So this is not just isolated to one property management group in town. And then certainly in terms of quality housing stock, uh, the prospective rental tenants um, that come to Muncie when they're first looking, they're pretty challenged by finding a nice place to live. So the homes that they do look at are older homes that have been remodeled, um, older homes that have not really been remodeled, they're just kind of still in not the best condition um, and they're being rented for a pretty nominal price. Um, and then just the quality and location of where those homes are. So if you're a student, you probably wanna be more near campus. Um, if you're not a student, <clears throat> excuse me, if you're not a student, you probably wanna be more near downtown or places that you can um, access for entertainment or shopping, um, those kinds of things. So these are really the three key takeaways from that. And in terms of who responded, uh, we had a majority of Ball State students respond, but not just Ball State students. Um, quite a few folks that were employed only full-time uh, or uh, employed or a student. The majority of folks reported that they were in a single family home, followed by a multifamily home or a duplex or an apartment. Uh, and then from there, the average number of beds was about two and the average number of uh, household mm -hmm. keepers on the lease mm -hmm. was about four. So first and fo foremost, just wanna talk about the state legislation piece, because this is really kind of the hallmark to what um, we can assume trickles down a lot of these issues locally. So in 2020, um, shortly before a lot of the widespread COVID measures took effect, um, the Indiana Senate uh, was drafting together something called Senate Enrolled Act 148. Uh, this is the whole piece of policy right here. The really <coughs> concerning part that I wanna highlight at the bottom is this really broad kind of um, just overarching uh, piece of language. So essentially this policy is telling you that as a municipality, as a unit of government in the state of Indiana, you cannot have any role in regulating the relationship between tenants or landlords in town. Uh, and so they obviously list off the screening process, the lease application, uh, the rights and um, liabilities to each party. But again, this other broad stroke piece that was added at the end was any other aspect of the tenant landlord relationship. So very broadly, no government in the state could be involved in any part of this relationship. Governor Holcomb, seeing a lot of his, his administration, seeing a lot of the um, upcoming COVID effects that were gonna be taking place in the state um, related to housing, related to evictions, um, he vetoed the measure. He saw it as really not an appropriate time for uh, all of this kind of policy to be taking place. Um, his veto was overturned in a two thirds vote and ultimately this was enact enacted as law. Um, from uh, the Fair Housing Center of Central Indiana, they were obviously highly concerned. Several housing advocacy groups in Indianapolis and from around the state were highly concerned. Um, this quote really being a good hallmark to that is, uh, we have no clue what this is going to do. We're really releasing this at a bad time. Um, it's super broad stroke and we are essentially allowing tenants to be super vulnerable um, under this policy. And locally, as I mentioned, this past fall, we saw a lot of that explode here. Um, so quite a bit of action related uh, locally, folks protesting out in front of some of the local uh, offices of property management groups, um, and certainly folks coming to city council to report uh, what their experience were. experiences were. This person said that their toilet broke, they didn't have access to a toilet or running water for three weeks. Um, the property manager wouldn't come out and there was no way to make them do it. Um, Next person, Councilwoman uh, Rose Selvey said that the more volume of complaints we have, the more it's going to draw uh, our Attorney General's attention uh, in town. And then uh, our representative from the state had said that uh, we, we need remedies. Clearly there's an issue. Um, this needs to be more of an issue that's addressed locally uh, and there's no ability for that to happen right now under uh, current state law. The data from the survey also shows that there is unaddressed rental maintenance in town. So uh, when asked if if folks report a rental issue or a maintenance issue in their home, um, about 61% of folks said that they at least once have had some sort of uh, maintenance issue. 
Um, six to 10 incidents, about 26% of people said that. And then over 10 incidents, about 7% had said that. Only 6% had not had a maintenance issue before. Uh, when further asked if you did have a maintenance issue, when did your property manager respond? Uh, about 27% uh, had said, you know, within the same week, so about average kind of middle of the road there. Um, but 10% had said one to two weeks later, a month later, more than a month later, on some pretty serious uh, maintenance request issues. Not just, you know, my paint in my bedroom is cracking, but my water's not working. We do not have hot water. It is mid-December and we do not have heat and we have, we have not heard from you in weeks about how you're going to address this issue. <clears throat> Uh, in terms of when rental maintenance is conducted, uh, about 22% of folks said it's pretty rare for their property manager to give them 24 hour advance notice. In the state of Indiana, it is a law that you have to notify your uh, tenants within 24 hours that there's going to be maintenance performed on the property. Um, that's a safety measure, of course, if you're alone in your unit, um, if you're sleeping in your unit and someone just walks in, I personally wouldn't be too fond of that. And this has happened plenty of times. There's lots of documented instances of this taking place. Uh, about 29% said that uh, about every time uh, staff are fixing the issue when they first show up and then staff are largely cleaning up the area that uh, they're doing construction in after they're done. These are some images from some physical rental maintenance issues. So um, this person said that their air conditioner leaks. Uh, this unit only has a permanent in-wall unit, so the water is <coughs> leaking into their home and they never heard back from their landlord on how they were going to address that. Um, another person had said there's a beam that's rotting away in their basement because of previous water damage and that was like that when they first moved in. So who knows how long that had been like that. So you can see those two pictures there. There's an example of um, the property management group of this person's home. That was how they left the project after it was done. They never came back. They just threw some drywall on it and kind of left it, uh, let it be. And there's still some water damage underneath that as well, if you can see there. Really the next takeaway then is the performance of property managers in town. So I mentioned that it's not just isolated to one property management group, it's, it's several, it's quite a few. So um, in terms of the communication of landlords in town, uh, management is somewhat available for requests. About 22% said that they really never find that their managers, property managers available for requests. 27% say, you know, yeah, when we reach out, we're, we're hearing back from our landlord. Um, about 23% middle of the road say that their management communication is professional, um, it's certainly timely, uh, and then about 26% say that management regularly communicates uh, information regarding the rental. So this was inclusive of that 24-hour advance notice, um, a showing taking place, any of the, those kinds of things pertaining to someone's own unit. These are some screenshots here of some email communications where uh, folks were just saying these issues that we've constantly brought up are not being addressed. This is someone who had said, we do not have hot water, please help us, but their uh, maintenance request was completed. They closed it. Um, if you're familiar with how this these programs work, I personally use a program very similar to this. Most tenants in town use an app like this. Uh, when a request is completed, it's off the docket. So the management personnel of that uh, property management group it's, it's closed, they're not going to deal with it any further. So something like hot water being closed, I mean, that's, it's, it's not going to be addressed anymore. So this person, of course, was frustrated. They kept sending some follow-up uh, requests. At one point, literally in all caps, saying, help, we, we do not have hot water. We've been trying to reach you and you're not uh, getting back to us. These are some quotes from there. So uh, they don't really follow through on their answers. They just wanna tell you something so that you'll stop bothering them. Um, they charged us with a bunch of random move out fees that didn't apply even though we left it in just as the same condition as uh, we did when we um, moved in and we refused to pay them and their information was set to a debt collector uh, for these pretty nominal fees. This person said this fee was around $40. Uh, but now they have a debt collector coming after them and now there's a record on them financially. Um, again, something that this person is not protected by under Indiana state law. In terms of leasing terms, so when folks first got their lease, uh, they turned it around, 49% turned it around in one day. Um, I think this also addresses a pretty critical issue, which is, are people reading their lease? Uh, I think you'll certainly hear from the property management community that this is their biggest kind of response to this is, uh, it's not our fault if this person's not reading the lease. Uh, they need to read it. And certainly they also should be looking at the house that they're signing the lease on. Um, Personally, my counter to that and what I've certainly heard a lot of folks say in this study is then why are you setting up these traps for us? Why do you know that you're gonna lead us into a bad unit with bad leasing terms and very stiff penalties if we are simply just trying to get help from you? 
Um, so certainly an area of concern there. Uh, about 60% of folks said that they did review the lease with someone else though. So specifically this question was asking if you reviewed it with a family member, uh, with a local housing nonprofit, with a lawyer, with any sort of legal services. Ball State has free legal services to students. Uh, but again, generally folks are somewhat reviewing their lease uh, before they sign it. About 60% of folks said that um, they didn't really have any sort of discomfort with their lease, but there's still about 40% of people that were still unsure about the language in their lease when they first received it. Um, of that 40%, 77% asked their management company that they were signing with to clarify that language, and about 63% said that when they asked, um, the management did clarify the lease uh, there. So about 37% said that they didn't hear back on clarification. Um, didn't ask any follow-up on if they chose to sign it anyways, but uh, that, that would certainly be an area of concern as well. Then we look at just the overall housing stock, the rental housing stock in Muncie. So um, if we look at the construction by years, you can see uh, it's a very top heavy chart. So most units have been built you know, around the um, 1970s, 60s, 50s. Uh, 1939 or earlier though is about 23%. So again, these are, and this is all of Muncie's housing tenure, I should say. So certainly there's some homeowners that are living in these homes as well. Um, but if you're a property management company buying one of these homes, it's probably not a whole lot of money that you're putting into it. At least that's what I've seen just kind of documented from this study. Um, kind of slapping paint on it, charging a nominal rent, and there it is. So um, these homes are often not remediated to the level that they need to be before they're rented. Um, and so certainly these very major maintenance issues like structural safety or plumbing or electrical, um, very critical life safety issues are not being addressed because the homes are just quite simply really old. Um, I should specify as well, this is later census data acknowledging we've had some apartment un un units and stuff like that open uh, in Muncie more recently. I just want to show you kind of the um, way that this has transitioned in a lot of our neighborhoods. So uh, this is Neely Avenue in uh, September of tw uh, 2007. So you can see older homes. If you know Neely today, it's uh, nicely decorated on the street. A lot of these homes have been rehabbed. So this is before and then this is after. So cleaning up the yard, adding some, uh, you know, more curb appeal, probably renovating these homes quite a bit on the inside. Um, so there's certainly a positive contribution to neighborhoods when this is done effectively. Um, certainly there's a good amount of work being done on some of these homes to the point where this is, this is a pretty nice looking street, right? I mean, if you've driven down Neely, there's a lot of very nice homes that face it. I wanna show you as well though, um, this is the same property management company that owns the homes that I just showed you. Um, this is in Old West End, so we're on Power Street. This is in 2007, um, and there's quite a few houses along the street here. This is a pretty good mix. This street had a nice mix of homeowners and renters, so I should specify that. But this house on the corner in particular is owned by that same property management company. And in 2021, the home actually looks worse. So what's happening? Is, is there actual investment being put into these homes? Um, is there any sort of uh, attention to just, again, like the basic structural issues? This porch certainly doesn't look safe. That beam is leaning a little bit more than the first picture. Um, so I think you can see kind of a positive benefit in some parts of the city, but in other parts, it's really just this, let's throw some paint on it and rent it for um, as much money as we can get out of it. And so reflecting that with the interior unit condition, uh, about 20% of folks said that their unit condition is poor. So they do not have good interior features. Uh, their appliances inside are not working very well. Um, they might not have a lot of uh, basic appliances. And again, things like hot water and stuff like that are not working. Um, again, there you can see appliances, water quality. So that was asking about the taste, the smell, um, the ability to get water, especially hot water. Um, about 33% of folk, folks said that it's okay. So something as basic as water quality that should probably be a little bit more positive um, was pretty middle of the road. Um, in terms of interior security, about 31% said that that's pretty poor. Um, so the locks, the doors, the window trim, all of that kind of stuff. Um, this is that photo that I just showed you a little bit ago. This is before they did maintenance on this wall and cut it out with the drywall. Um, so the whole source of this, there was a uh, unit above this person where the toilet had flooded the year prior. And so when this person was taking a shower, um, they would get shocked whenever they were in the shower. So they were touching the um, any sort of like faucet, uh, I guess, feature. Um, the tub was cast iron. So all of it was shocking her. And she even like put on shoes and tried to like ground herself in the shower and it was still shocking her. Um, the maintenance company came out and tapped the, uh, 
I, I don't know if they tapped necessarily the faucet, but just like the tub with a voltmeter and it was positive, it was green. So there was a current running through it and it was because this water was coming down, touching the interior wires and then somehow inside of the wall affecting her own water pipes. Um, so a very critical issue and this, this was something that she found out like it, it had to happen. She got shocked and then she had to find out that that was the case with this unit. In terms of the exterior unit condition, um, this one is a little bit better. So I think you find that about, uh, you know, 23%, 27% say fair or good here. Um, I think certainly, again, like the windows, doors, locks from the outside are not in the best condition, but uh, exterior lighting is a little bit better. Um, in terms of overall exterior curb appeal from the interviews, uh, I had heard that it's kind of a mix. I think it's just based on, again, if you live on Neely and have one of these really nice remodeled homes um, versus a lot of the streets in Old West End, these are, again, very old homes that are being um, just occupied by these property management companies. This is someone who had shared that their duplex stairs were leaning to the side and they had a large gap between them and the house so that when they were walking up the stairs, they were doing so at about a 20 degree angle. Um, when they notified their landlord, the landlord thanked them for letting them know and came out and nailed a two by four right there. And if you look closely, that's floating on the concrete pad. That's not actually on the concrete base that it should be sitting on. Um, so again, a very significant structural issue, a very significant egress issue that wasn't really addressed. Uh, then these neighborhood safety questions. Again, figured this was relevant in terms of why folks chose to live where they live. Um, so about 16% say that they strongly agree that they feel safe with where they live, uh, where their unit's located. Um, during the day, about 33% of folks say that they strongly agree that it's safe to walk outside. At night, that kind of tilts more uh, towards the disagree area, about 30% are middle of the road on that one. Um, and then reviewing neighborhood quality, largely was somewhat of an issue that folks were looking at when they you know, first signed their lease, but um, not necessarily the most important thing that they were looking at. So again, just thought that that was uh, an interesting questionnaire to ask. So kind of some actions coming out of this, um, and these are super high stroke, which is why I really wanna have this discussion today, um, is, is what can we do? So really continuing to engage with local representatives um, to just highlight the damage that this legislation is doing to health and safety in the state. These are critical issues that are taking place that are really allowed to happen. And again, if you try to retaliate in some cases, you're really not protected from eviction. Um, I put that little asterisk there because this needs to continue to be at the top of the priority list. There was a bill this session that was uh, going to remediate some elements of SEA 148, um, but it died in committee. So clearly it's not a priority issue in the state right now, although it needs to be. This is basic quality of life for folks that are trying to find a home here. Um, continue engaging rental tenants in neighborhoods all throughout Muncie. I would really love for this model to continue to be reproduced in our other neighborhoods, especially on the south side where a lot of this acquisition is continuing to take place at a much higher rate. So again, homes that are not in the best condition being acquired, um, not really much work being done to them, and then um, rents certainly being increased and uh, rented out to new people. And then in terms of housing quality, I think there's really an opportunity to bring a lot of folks to the table. So whether that's bringing real estate professionals, uh, our government and local leaders, uh, nonprofit leaders, um, bring them together to, in the same room to really realize that for us to all um, have a successful city uh, in terms of the local market, in terms of the types of jobs that we want to attract, um, housing is key. And so especially rental housing, uh, there's certainly an opportunity there for, uh, again, folks that are coming in and not really uh, sure what the condition of housing is in Muncie, um, why not provide them with, with some good opportunities to, um, to have some quality housing there? So um, again, three really high level action areas, certainly ones that would need a lot of work. Um, and so I'd love to have some, some brief discussion around these three areas, but um, let's see. Awesome, yeah. Thank you so much. This, is, uh, this has been a really exciting project. Thank you. Any questions, first off? I can certainly go back to some slides. Yes? Did you happen to reach out to uh, like Wilmington or Lafayette to see what they have going on? Because at one time I was thinking Purdue worked with Lafayette and they had a, kind of a, you know, not a good relationship, but the city did give in on some things because uh, I'm a, a landlord and uh, years ago our rental association bought it, but uh, I've known for a long time that we needed it. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
I can't believe the Board of Health wouldn't help on the issue of no toilet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just can't believe that they wouldn't have some teeth to reach in. Yeah, and so at a pretty basic level, um, so the Building Commissioner's Office has been really the point source for folks to go to um, because the basic stuff can really be um, nipped pretty quickly. So uh, whether it's, in a lot of cases, the outcome of that really just being fines. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, if anyone in the room um, knows a little bit more on that process than I do, but um, all I've seen is that they just find the property manager and they keep finding them until it gets addressed or they no longer allow the home to be occupied. Um, so those have really been the two outcomes. I haven't reached out to anyone at any of uh, either of those cities, but certainly have studied it because they're the only two cities really in Indiana that have had some sort of rental unit um, database or policy or tenant agreement. So we actually can, oh, I'm with the building commissioner's office, awesome. yeah. I'm Becky Moon, and we can only send letters and find property owners we don't get to do much with the property <coughs> managers <coughs> the property managers are who the students are going to or whoever's running it and we don't know if they've been told or not all we have is what is being told to us we're asked to come in do an inspection we inspect it we put an unsafe order at the property plus mail something to the owner letting them know what's going to happen within 30 days 60 days 90 days and sometimes they ignore us to the point of the properties that don't have property managers at all they just don't care mm -hmm. i mean as long as they're getting their rent every month they don't care if people are living there with no utilities or anything and that was the interviews indicated that several times so yes. yes yeah absolutely yeah so yeah a lot of times a lot of these people are out of state mm -hmm. and we have the monthly hearings and if they don't show up then there's a fine assessed to the property taxes okay so yeah but the property management we we just have to deal with we can't do anything to them yeah. Thank you. My office, what we'll do is uh, we will help the renter find who the property manager is, or not the property the owner of the property, and let them know who that person is because that's tax uh, information, um, and have them get in contact with the owner. Now, again, like Becky said, a lot of these owners don't care. They live out of state. They don't have any investment in Nancy other than they bought a house or bought a property. They haven't even been to the property. They just bought it. Yeah, nine times out of 10, it's through a tax sale yeah. online. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or they'll buy it just to fluff their financial records and never pay never the taxes, nothing. Yes. So if you have not heard about, um, there was a issue in Anderson, um, Bingham Apartments. If you Google that, it's a classic example, I think, of this challenge because um, the health department has been involved, the building commissioner, um, but they were out of state owners. They kept switching property management, maybe even ownership, I don't know. Um, but these people didn't have running water, and um, Brandon, you probably remember some of the details, but I mean, they were like huge issues. Um, and the city even gave them like $95,000 to fix the problems, and they took that and still didn't fix the problems. And so, like, we're getting calls from, um, you know, other nonprofits in the community that have had stories from the tenants and. Um, we're a head housing counseling organization and um, just like what can you do and it's very very frustrating um, I, I was at the point to where like are these people still paying rent because you're not supposed to stop paying your rent um, but literally like I felt like you shouldn't be paying to live there 
Um, and then the whole thing of, you know, the displacement that happens if, you know, you do declare that the um, building is not livable. Um, it was just like they didn't know what they were going to do with all these people. It's just, it's just a huge issue. Yeah. And I think that at the end of the day, the only way you're going to solve those kind of issues um, is for Indiana to pass legislature for like rent escrow mm -hmm. so that yeah. landlords don't get money if they are, I mean, that's the only thing that some landlords understand. They won't get money if their apartments are not, you know, safe for people, safe sanitary apartments. Yeah. So, and I'm forgetting the House bill specifically that was put up this session, but it would be it that. So, gets, yeah. Yes, it was it was going to be a um, court ordered account, essentially, that the court would hold until it's clear that major <coughs> issues have been right. resolved. Um, and so, that's what some other places have done, other mm -hmm. states have done. And I think that it's very um, efficient. And um, that's you know the only thing. States you would like to see as model. I don't know. Do you remember? I could probably find it and shoot it tonight, maybe. Um, Illinois has a, 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 a rent escrow policy. Who does? Uh, Illinois. Illinois. Uh, Wisconsin. Uh, I'm not sure about Michigan. I know New York State does. I mean, it's, it's pretty common. It's, it's not like we're not talking about like coastal, you know, coastal places like normal states have these. <laughs> yeah. Didn't Muncie have a thing that they were going to pass, an ordinance they were going to pass for uh, a database for landlords? Did we never do? We never did that. Did so that, that was Max's question. Yes. So what role would uh, rental registry play in improving these conditions and public accountability with the current state legislation really dismantling any kind of local policy? It's just absolutely yeah. complicated. So a rental registry at its core is just transparency. Like we know where your units are. It's essentially what the city is telling property managers in town. Um, so automatically there's some level of accountability that you could easily show up and do a point inspection at any time if you wanted to on our units um, because it's operating like a business. Um, so that's, that's really the core piece. The other one is uh, in terms of housing distribution, it offers a little bit more insight on where people are renting just demographically. Um, so those are really kind of the two areas that, that I've read on as well. And typically there's permitting fees, like if you're going to register your home as a new property manager, um, you have to pay and essentially get an occupancy permit. So, and that renews annually or with the lease. So if you're re-signing a lease, um, that has to be inspected again before the lease is renewed. It's applied many different ways, but the kind of the most applied way is, is those inspections. Yeah, we had efforts with 2017, is that right? Um, yeah, and I mean, it, it didn't happen. So it would, mm -hmm. it's a good conversation to have going forward. Yeah. How do we make that? I um, honestly don't have a clue what happened with the rental registration. It was voted down. Oh, yeah, by the council? council? That's right. Okay. Yeah. And again, state law makes any ordinance like that null and void currently today. There's, it's all preemptive, so there's really no ability for municipalities to do any sort of monitoring yeah. that way. Um, yes. I'm just kind of piggybacking off what you said, Ms. Moon, right, right at the end about nine out of ten of these properties folks are getting from the tax sale. Um, we, we, we're, we're trying to, to create a new, um, I don't know, just gather the data to understand what's happened in the last 15, 20 years. Um, some of the demographic changes around home ownership. Um, uh, what are some of the ones we've talked about, Joe? Home ownership. Uh, ownership location. Like yeah, non-local versus uh, local ownership. Um, and then, you know, we want to be careful not to make assumptions. Um, but, I mean, for me, I feel like, you know, you can talk about measures after the fact, you know, trying to have registries, um, rent and escrow. Um, but the other side of it is how do you create, how do you create more relationship between owner and, and renter? Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the closer you can make that relationship, the, uh, it seems that there'd be less getting over on each other. 
So um, one of the one of the really interesting things. Um, so I attended the American Planning Association National Conference, and it was in Pennsylvania. It was in Philadelphia this year. Um, and one of the things that they're doing statewide there is a mediation program. So they had folks from the the city housing department, but also from the state. Um, essentially explain this this process where you would bring the landlord or the property manager in the room with the tenant and with a third party mediator and the idea is to not go to court so that's like the end goal how can we not make this a legal process on paper because again that's that inflicts negative things for the property manager as well as you know potentially a record for um, the tenant so uh, mediation has been a pretty interesting practice mm -hmm. The way that they're able to do it, though, is it's enabled by law. Mm -hmm. yeah. So they, they have the space to, you are required as a property manager and as a tenant, if you're notified of a mediation, you have to show up mm -hmm. um, or else the penalties are a little bit stiffer. Um, did you, did, sorry, did you see any correlation between less complaints and things like that between owners that live in Muncie and tenants and their tenants? <laughs> Owners of property, specifically owners that are here. Yeah, no, I, I didn't. No, I have not looked at that. Yeah, okay. yeah, be interesting. Yeah, so, just a real quick aside, <laughs> and that, and I maybe less so me spent like hundreds of hours putting together a mediation program that is now um, available through the county court. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, but there's extremely, extremely low uptake because uh, landlords are not compelled to enter into uh, mediation and the, the laws are so favorable for landlords that they have no incentive uh, to enter into negotiation about um, how can I get this person out of their lease without damaging their credit, without making them homeless, without all of those other things. They'd rather just send a lawyer and be done with the, with the process. Um, so. It's like so many other, of the other things where we're, we're kind of trapped by, uh, you know, by, by, by legislation. Yeah, because when I was property manager, and this was 15, 18 years ago in Massachusetts, it <clears throat> did not serve the property owner any good to evict. Like, he actually, the property manager, the property owner actually <coughs> ended up paying more to evict a person that was willing to pay rent, you know, they were just late on their rent. But it actually, because you had, there was very strict rules in place and it was tenant friendly. I mean, like in New York, some of the New England states are, I would almost say too tenant friendly. Because you stay in, and if you stay in a place for more than three or four days, you're considered a tenant and then it's ridiculous. But I mean, if you have a lease, it is very tenant friendly up there and property managers and property owners have a real motive to work with because sometimes you, you end up paying like three times their rent if you want them out in 30 days mm -hmm. or their moving costs or and you can't touch any of their property for 90 days and so it's, it's very advantageous to the tenant and Indiana has none none of that not any Oh, yeah, online. and in Philadelphia, their model was super interesting because there was collective agreement on mediation. Like they, they actually, so it was a coalition of nonprofits that would come together and either send the invitations for uh, mediation counseling, or they would uh, be in the room physically, or they would hire a third party mediator. Uh, they kind of played a couple different roles, but um, their their whole thing was that the law is is a collective that everyone really agrees on. Um, in the state because they don't want to go through eviction proceedings there. They don't want to go through that whole process. Um, so it's very agreed upon, at least in, in Philadelphia. I think another layer to this issue, when you think about families and children, which I know it's not like highly represented in this population is, mm -hmm. um, in the southwest, southeast kind of like uh, area of Muncie, um, we have data that like renter mobility uh, from two years ago, the most recent piece, um, is five times the state and national average for families like moving to different houses within the same community. And so uh, where that piece comes from is actually George and Francis Law Foundation as they look at their Cradle to Career initiative and how that impacts students moving from maybe one school to another. And so they've lost track of a way to engage or monitor that student in their, in their curriculum. And so they're at one reading level and at one lesson at one school then they're moving to another and they're being lost. Mm -hmm. But how much of that is because of 
the conditions of their homes and they're being forced to, to move. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Do you factors that impact the child from birth to college? There's no way to track a whole of them. In working or having worked with uh, domestic violence victims, uh, most of my job was going with them and talking to their landlords, property managers, and asking them to get out of the lease. Nine times out of ten, they would not let them out of their lease. And in fact, they would evict that victim for filing a police report. And for the and charge them the damage to the house that the That's IPV right. caused. So, yes, I worked with victims advocate for a long time. Yes, I know. And so a lot of people aren't aware of these things, mm-hmm. and that population isn't what you know. They're not reporting out, right? So. Uh, whenever I have the opportunity, I always want to tell people that this is actually happening, and it's legal. They're allowed to do that. No, sort of not. There's there's Violence Against Women's Act, VAWA, VAWA, and they are not supposed to. But you mind that that applies that's across the board, right? Well, that not is, just federal. That's federal. Federal. Okay. So um, we are landlords, and we have um, federal dollars in our housing. And so we're very sensitive to, and there's a form that we have people sign with their lease, um, that you can't do that. So it'd be interesting to know if those were, you know, the entire situation. But there is some protection. It may be dependent on yeah, what they, type of housing they're in. Yeah, and but, they use other extraneous things, oh, sure. right? Yeah. Like they pull together an argument, and that, that's the, yeah. yeah. It's just, um, it really opened my eyes. Having worked with that population. Something that I have seen in a couple of the Facebook groups too is a lot of the property management companies deny Section 8. I think probably partially for that so that they don't have to get involved in really the federal in and out of those yeah. kinds of things. Yeah. Well, I missed um, how many participants were in the survey? Yeah, so in total we had 90. 90 from both. Right. Yeah. And then I would love to, to talk to you about like how do we get the survey and Yes, yeah, and realizing again, like there's so much more to be talked about on the south side for sure. So, yeah. So, this was a longitudinal data. Are you going to, or no, qualitative or quantitative? It's mixed. So, the survey was uh, quantitative, but you could open end respond on some of those. Um, so that text was looked at and analyzed for themes, and then the interview was qualitative, which was analyzed for themes. Are there plans for your department to continue this? Like, you're graduating tomorrow? That was the other <laughs> Are you going to create, are you going to make it a longitudinal study? There it goes. Yeah, Thank so um, Dr. West and I will be working over the summer to really add some more substance to this thing. So there's still some, like, final research elements I have to do. I mean, creating a model would be really interesting. I'm not leaving right away. I'm not leaving tomorrow, but... Um, being around the summer, that could be a discussion. Yeah. Just like as an idea to float now. Uh, yeah. One of the things our, our program does is a neighborhood uh, plan. Uh, so we go to each neighborhood and do a <coughs> plan. And I can imagine this being folded into the survey. Uh, so typically, the, the plan is very much focused on the physical appearance of the neighborhood. It'd be really interesting to have a, this survey as part of each neighborhood. Um, and then at the end of that, we would have gathered, you know, as we progress through the neighborhoods, we would have that information updated um, you know, pretty regularly. I'd like to yeah. see that in the county too. Yeah. Trustees, mm-hmm. maybe. Or, hmm. yeah, yeah. Was this uh, uh, survey anonymous, or do you have an idea of like? where these uh, residents that, that responded, where they live. Yeah, so this was anonymous. The basic demographic questions uh, were what street do you live on? And then just housing profile. So how many folks are you um, living with? Um, what is your current occupation? Which was student versus full-time employee versus the other categories. So I try to keep curious, it anonymous. Going off what Nate asked about yeah. how many of them are local homeowners versus yeah. out of state. It'd be um, interesting to see a layer of like know this area we know these like dozen property owners have yeah. properties in this area like mm-hmm. who can we I mean, we know uh, 
Joy and I, and I know there's others specifically, there's one out of state owner that we've tried to acquire properties and they've either given us an outrageous price that they'll sell it or they just they just won't sell it. Is this your Connecticut person? Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. 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 And essentially, I mean, we 160 properties were just given to them. Yeah. Essentially, and I, I don't, I can't understand why. You, we've asked for properties given? that we've not gotten. So, what, do you, what do you mean given? I paid a very low amount. Okay. It was one hundred so the dollars so Delaware property. County? Or, yes. Uh, yeah. 38 properties. And that was That's given. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can afford I think that. They have a, I think last I checked, they had around 160 yeah. in Muncie right now. Uh, this one, this one yeah. this is one company. And there's been about a half a dozen lots or houses that they have that we tried to take that step to improve or put a new house on or rehab what was there and it, we just were stopped. Mm -hmm. Sherry, is there any conversation like on your end of like what are safeguards that county can put in to like Well, I'm, this? I'm just thinking mm -hmm. this is a board of health. That's our go-to. <laughs> and I would think that they would have something that they could do inspections when they, I don't know, I mean, or like limiting who can purchase the properties. Like, well, yeah, but that's kind of hard. I think that um, just from my perspective, the whole thing about the tax sale and all that, if there's possible, and I don't know, like with legislation or whatever, to stop it there, like yeah. Becky does an amazing job, their department does an amazing job, but how many people work in your department? Five? And they're I mean, like, <laughs> they are they're overworked. They're overworked. Yeah, they're constantly. constantly. And so they if they, if yeah. there was, like, okay, you bought this house in the tax sale for $1,000, that's fine. Uh, if we had enough per people that could monitor that and be like, oh wait, two weeks later there's people moving into that property, that's a problem. But they don't have the staff. I mean, they everyone that works there does a great job, but they don't have the funding or the staff to do that. And so the only way, I think, the way you get people to stop is like what Annette said, is control the money. If they spent money on a property and now they can't rent it, then, you're, then they either have to pay attention or they're gonna sell it or they're gonna get out of Muncie or whatever. But when they're getting rent, why why make any changes when on paper, like you said, I have this forty thousand dollar quad that that I make eighteen hundred dollars a month on make or whatever. Um, yeah, that's how I feel. <laughs> but, I but I mean that's just like so it looks good for their financials, but they do have to because you can't maintain a property like that. Or like due diligence for the purchaser. I mean, is there no way to like say, All right, you're gonna come in Sandy and we already have like 15 built up property complaints about you, Sandy, as the owner. We're no longer going to let you buy more property. Well, that's, that's what the land bank yeah. is for. Yeah. Yeah. Like, and that's is, why we have to use them yeah. more. The, the host of the meeting here, the, the land bank, yeah. uh, that's like our entire function. Yes. Yeah. Right? When properties are given by the county to the land bank or when they're sold to the land bank or when the city gives us property, the, anyone who wants to purchase property has to go through a due diligence process that Joe actually runs. He checks on the person's background um, or the LLC. Uh, we look at their development plan. And uh, this is like the city of Evansville in southern Indiana 10 years ago created a land bank through an interlocal agreement between the city and the county and all of the tax sale properties that's what I was thinking. That didn't sell in the first round go to the land bank. Maybe they should all move there first. The, the yes, land bank then tax sale first for the legislation yeah. but after that. The, the land bank then that's all the, the property owners mm -hmm. and they have had a lot of a lot of success. And it's not something unlike this rental issue, it's not something that the state has preempted. Mm -hmm. the, the cities land city-based land bank that we have here, the Muncie Land Bank, can enter into local uh, intergovernmental local agreements with the county if the county was willing to say, we are going to give you our abandoned properties. But that, that's, that is a very difficult, um, you know, we, we've been, I, we're, we're kind of just starting up um, and we I think we've had to prove a track record, but we've had a lot of success. How, we've turned over how many properties now? 46. We've turned, we've uh, acquired and turned over 46 properties, and those are those are properties where we know that the person who's going to take it that they don't have liens on their property, they don't have you know certain kinds of issues in their background, and that they have a development plan for it. 
Um, and that's not, I mean, that's nothing compared to the 160 properties that were given away, but it's its something, you know? Well, it, it sounds it, like an answer to me. Yeah. Right. It sounds we like a proactive. <laughs> now that we just have to convince the broader audience. <laughs> Who is that? The county. Yeah. Well, county I'll, council. I'll, I'll defend the county. <laughs> Ten years ago, when James and I became commissioners, we were approached to give some second sale to the MRC and I was all for it and I hate to say it but they kind of made fun of in two or three years they hadn't done anything with it well they weren't landlords the other two commissioners and I knew it took time well we did get some of those over to you I believe now mm -hmm. and so we've learned our lesson it's all new you know and and then isn't the uh, treasurer on your board or his appointment mm -hmm. Melbourne, is on the yeah. land bank board but the, the land bank i mean you know ohio is the testimony how wonderful yeah. these your, your land bank is yeah. and we love the county they, yeah. they've given us all the properties that we've had real success with it's just we can we can do more just keep that. asking yeah. if you don't ask dci will take it or something as part of the development proposal for that review process, does that involve asking the intent of to rent the property, to own the property as a homeowner? What's the... Yes. Yeah. And okay. we also look at like financial information to like make sure they can actually do it. Because a lot of people will say like, yeah, I want to rehab this house. And they'll say like, oh, I'll spend a thousand dollars to do it yeah. or something. And then you'll end up with, you know, the repeating cycle. So like okay. we kind of look into make sure like they have the ability to do it and they have the intention to do it. Okay. Um, yeah. Gotcha. I would love to see the, the tax sales. There be some type of rule or law or something to where if you live outside of the state of Indiana or you live a hundred or more miles away from the city that you're wanting to buy in, that no more out of state buyers could buy these properties. I mean, we have people in Canada. Yeah, I, I mean, it's ridiculous. And trying to track down these owners and make them obey the ordinances of this city is impossible. Well, I'm just we have out of state, you know, tuition. Yeah. It, 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 they're, yeah. Yeah. It doesn't make any sense. They, they will have these houses, and it takes two years before the county will take the property back if you don't pay your property taxes. And some of those get yeah. slipped through just by changeover or whatever. And that property will be owned by that person with all those taxes due that doesn't get paid. So when they do a tax sale and these people out of state pay those back taxes, hey, it's back on the tax roll. Well, guess what? That's the only money they spend. And then it's another two to four year process or they'll move it to another LLC name. It should, I wish, we did not sell to out-of-state buyers, period. Um, this is, I, I have to run, but thank you, Will. You guys thank have you, another yeah. 20 minutes if folks want to continue to converse. This is why we have this space. We start, you know, we, we look at something and then it, we, we try to talk, have real conversation about the issues. So I really appreciate you coming yeah. in. Thank yeah. you all for, for chiming in. You guys can keep come conversing. I've got to run. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, and I think kind of the toolkit. So replicating replicating this model in different neighborhoods, I think would be a really key thing. So certainly um, John and I will work to do a little bit of that this summer so that neighborhoods can get a better idea of what's happening. Because Old West End and Riverside Normal City are obviously way up here, right? I mean, this this is happening in, in Southside. It's happening more east as well. So, yeah. I do wonder if it'd be possible to figure out how to get ownership data with that kind of survey. Yeah, um, for sure. Because I think that could help us out because, like, we have these experiences with out-of-state owners. Um, it'd be cool to see that, to see if that lines up with tenant experiences. Absolutely, um, yeah. 
you know, a lot of the people rent these homes completely online, sight unseen, take the owners at whatever it is that they put online to be true, and then they move in, a month later, they've got a hole in the ceiling, yeah. they've yep. got floorboards falling in, and that's kind of all the they other. have is a bank account to go and make their rent payment, yep. that's it. And that's kind of this other public education piece, you know, the back on the screen with the, the lease signing, I'll have to jump to it. I mean, there's a lot of people that just sign it, right? They, they just sign oh, it and turn yeah. it around. Um, which not to fault the tenants, but that's that's just due diligence that you should probably be doing. <laughs> so, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, if there's nothing else. Thank you all so much. Really appreciate it. This has been a super exciting project, so I really appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations.